So, hello everybody. I hope that you are doing well and that you're ready for another lecture on political economy. This time around, I will repeat or try to clarify some of the things remaining from uh, some of the problems remaining with the uh, with Harold Demzett's paper, the multiple people complained that his own presentation was difficult to, to follow and that the, the article was difficult to understand. So I will try and lay out some of the major ideas in this article and trying to explain why the article is important and uh, what is the main, what is the connection with the problem of political economy in general. So the article is titled Problem of Social Cost, What Problem? Suggesting that the idea or the problem is not real, actually, that it's overblown or it's um, overrated or overdramatized. So it's a critique of reasoning that by Ar Arthur Cecil Pigou. Arthur Cecil Pigou is a well-known figure who is a um, British economist who was first to develop the theory of social cost that we know of already. So that's the theory of externality. So Demzit is criticizing him. And also, interestingly enough, Ronald Coase. Ronald Coase is an author who criticized Pigou and who said that Pigou's um, theories about externality were unfounded and he offered his own explanation. However, Demzitz is equally critical of Coase's solution of the problem of social costs, and he goes at some length to explain what to explain why. So that's what the paper is all about. It's it's a critique of the theory of externality in 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 its two forms, or two ways, by two versions, if you will, by Pigou and by Coase and arguing that the problem of externality has been systematically over-dramatized by economists and offers, we can say, like a free market take of the problem of social costs and externality. That Demzit argues that to the extent that externality problem exists, it could be blamed or it should be blamed more on the government's inability to enforce private property rights rather than on the failure of markets to adequately uh, put a price on resources on, and equalize individual and social cost. So we'll start first with, with explanation of two things as a, as a matter of setting up the stage here or the context for what we are talking about. First, what is the standard of efficiency uh, of a market economy that Demzitz accepts? That's number one. And number two, what is the essence of the theory of social cost? And why, why the theory of social cost and externality um, questions of, uh, the theory of market efficiency as it has been developed by the neoclassical econ economists. So neoclassical economy is, a, is, is the prevailing form of economic theory from the late 19th century onwards. Okay, so what is the standard of efficiency, of market efficiency that Demzitz is talking about? He calls it the perfect decentralization system or the si system of perfect competition. Here in, the, in this yellow shaded part of the text we see what he has in mind, it's the, the system of perfect competition or per, uh, perfect decentralization, as he calls it, is just, just a model, economic model that uh, um, develops or further, further um, refines the basic intuition by Adam Smith about the invisible hand of the free market. The idea of the markets as mechanisms of cooperation, of the systems of cooperation in which people are pursuing their individual self-interests, guided by prices of goods and services, maximize the social welfare, maximize the welfare of everybody. Entrepreneurs are guided by prices and driven by profit motive. 
but uh, compelled by the competitive mechanism to create better and more innovative goods and services at lower prices. That's the only way of surviving in a market economy. So that's the basic general framework. However, perfect competition model puts some formal requirements or some formal model description of the conditions in which this is the case. This is essential to this task was the development of a model of a decentralized private ownership economic system. That's to, to, explain, to explain Adam Smith's invisible hand picture of a market economy. One in which individuals freely act on behalf of their own personal interests, have no control over each other's actions, so they are independent and inform their decisions by way of market-determined prices. That's just what I told you. Mainline economists writing during the neoclassical period of economics completed these tasks early in the 20th century. The core of their modeling effort became known as the perfect competition model, a label that seems misleading to me. The model really says little about competitive activities except insofar as entry and exit into a market is thought to be uh, thought of as a competitive activity. So you see this uh, set of preconditions for the perfect perfectly competitive markets. You will remember a large number of suppliers, free entry and exit, no barriers to entry, in other words, perfect information, uh, in almost infinitely, infinitely large number of suppliers, no, homo, no, no um, what is the term, uh, diversification of products. So one homogeneous product is being sold. And prices, prices are taken as, uh, as given data. So no competitor can influence the price of his or her product. So nothing about altering price, improving technology, investing in advertising and so on. Now the key component is its real contribution is to offer an analytically coherent view of the working of a highly decentralized unplanned economic system. And it should have been labeled and in this essay is labeled perfect decentralization. So what he wanted to show here is that in early 20th century, people believed in socialism. People believe that the centrally com uh, controlled economy is more efficient than an economy that is driven by prices and decentralized decision making. Perfect decentralization models shows that this is not the case. If all resources are privately owned, people are independent to make independently uh, uh, capable of making their own decisions without coercion by anybody else, if there is a large number of suppliers and only price mechanism that governs them, eventually you will have an economically efficient allocation of resources. So that's the result of the model. Now, what are the problems with this? The problems are, you remember that there might be monopolies in which this, some of the assumptions here do not hold anymore, but then <coughs> consequently, consequently the applicability of the model will be less than 100%. But the main idea when, when the second problem of social cost comes in is that there are some situations in which the price mechanism would fail to guide economic activity efficiently, some situations in which the economic system will uh, fail to adequately, um, to adequately distribute costs and benefits of economic action. So that's a system of that's a system of uh, positive social cost or social cost that is higher than individual cost or system of externality. So, so you know from the very beginning of the course, we talked about this, the social cost is higher than individual cost. If a single individual firm has the ability to earn profit for itself and to pay only for the portion of the costs that, that it inflicts on society. If you're a firm that is polluting the environment, that's the most classical case, then you can get away with actually charging the full price for your product, while in reality paying only the parts, parts of your costs, while avoiding to pay the price of environmental pollution and economic and non-economic damages that result from that. So that's Pigou's theory of externalities, externalizing costs and creating social 
uh, or creating social cost that is higher than individual cost. That's one and the same thing. Individual cost for a pr privately polluting f firm are the cost of labor, raw materials, electricity, taxes, the, the, the items that they pay for. The social cost is the, the, the cost of consuming these resources that are paid for, plus environmental costs that are not paid for. So there's this mismatch between social cost and individual firms cost. And that's market inefficiency because the market system is based on the idea that you pay the competition is a system in which people in, in which firms are forced to cut their costs to the minimum and to sell at a profitable price only if their productivity is higher than their cost. However, if they have a way of getting around this, if they have a way of somehow um, outsourcing or uh, front loading or uh, or, or uh, rolling over to somebody else parts of its cost, the firm is not really profitable because it doesn't pay part of the costs that it creates. So then the market mechanism that allows this to happen is an inefficient market system. And it requires an intervention by the government in the forms of taxes and subsidies. So the firms that are inflicting the damage to, uh, to the third parties, imposing social costs that are not compensated by that firm, have to be taxed in order to reduce, in order for them to force, in, 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 in order to force them to reduce the level of activity of this socially harmful activity. And in the same time, the government needs to subsidize the victims of their activity in order to mitigate or moderate the negative effects of these firms' activities on them. So one of the examples of these types of situations in which social costs could, uh, could occur is this example of two roads that you have on page, what is the page three on Demsitz's article. The example is Pigou's. Pigou is the guy who developed this theory that I just repeated, briefly summarized. And he uses the example of two roads, one narrow road and quicker road and the other the wide road, but lacking, uh, uh, lacking directness, the, uh, it's more roundabout road. So he says one road is subject to considerable congestion because it is narrow, the other road is wide and escapes much of this congestion. congestion. But lacking the directness of the narrow road, its users require a longer time to travel between the terminal points. Pigou claims that traffic will be inefficiently distributed to these two roads because drivers who choose the quicker road will have done so without regard to the cost their actions will put on other users of this road by way of increasing the degree of congestion they face. Hence, the narrow road is overused and the broad road is underused. The claim difference between private cost to a driver, which does not include the added congestion cost borne by others, and social cost, which does, in, does include the added congestion cost, is a marker for inefficient resource allocation. So which means that people will be overusing a narrow road, creating congestion, and underutilizing the broad road, creating also uh, social cost. So the socially optimal allocation of traffic between the two roads will be much less traffic on the narrow road and much more traffic on the broad road. Whereas in reality we have the opposite, which is then inefficient. And this requires then the government taking over the system and reallocating the traffic in a better way. So now Frank Knight solved this problem and he had shown, he, he's a guiding light here. Frank Knight was Harold Demsitz's teacher, professor. So in many ways, he was influenced by Frank Knight. By the way, Frank Knight was the guy who developed this perfect competition model. So this debate with, with Pigou and, um, and Coase might be slightly personal because they, are, they were attacking Harold Demsitz's teacher, personally. Nevertheless, Frank Knight publishes a paper in which he says this is not this is not correct. The main problem with Pigou's example here is that the, the two roads are not privately owned. If they were privately owned, what, what would have happened? 
then the private owner of the uh, of the narrow road would have charged pay tolls for the use of the road. So then the the demand for the services of the narrow road will go would have gone down because of a higher price and a larger number of people would shift to the broad road, which would be cheaper, probably, would be cheaper because it's it's longer, but then a larger number of people will shift there. So imagine that you have any any kind of like a BMW, imagine BMW and and uh, Ford, two types of cars. I, imagine if you abolish the price system and private property, you know, everybody would want to have everybody would would want to have a BMW, and then there would be a shortage of BMW and a surplus of and a surplus of uh, Fords. But that's not a market failure. The problem is that there are no pricing mechanisms to exclude the free riders from from overuse in the BMW. Once you introduce private property and uh, the price system, the consumption of BMWs will be rationed. Much less people would, would, would buy BMW. People with weaker preferences would drop out and many of them would, would shift to Ford if Ford is the only alternative. Just as many of the users of a more efficient and better narrow road would have shifted to the broader road and, and less direct road if the price of using the, the, the former would have gone up. So the example cannot illustrate the inefficiency of an economic system that rests exclusively on private resource allocation. Knight argues that the use of these roads, had they been privately owned in a competitive setting, would have been priced by their owners so as to achieve an efficient allocation of traffic. The price to use the narrow road would have been raised to levels higher than the price asked to use the broad road. Properly interpreted, Pigou's example reveals the opposite of what he intended. It shows inefficiency arising from a flaw in public or collective management of scarce resources. Public administrators have failed to price the use of these roads so as to achieve an efficient allocation of traffic. So see Frank Knight's criticism of Pigou is that he misunderstood the institutional setting in which the kind of effect he is describing is happening. This social cost that some resources are overused and some resources are, are underused. So probably the narrow road would have been then overused and would require a higher repair and so on, while the, the other road will be um, underused. This doesn't uh, this doesn't follow from the from, from any failure or, or um, um, weakness of the price system, it follows from the absence of private property rights and the price system. So that's the criticism, so that's his criticism of Pigou. And that's one of the motives that you will remember from the first paper on private property rights, that the Denzitz argues that externality for the most part could be interpreted theoretically as an absence or insufficiently developed private property rights. So, for example, the reason why you can inflict inflict an uncompensated economic damage to my property with your industrial plant is that that, that my private property rights in my in my uh, uh, property are not sufficiently precisely defined. Once they are clearly delineated and precisely defined, then you don't have a right. You will have to pay the full cost of your activities. If my right, for example, against against sound pollution are enforced, then you cannot impose externality on, on me of listening to rap music, rap music in the afternoon, because my private property rights in using my apartment is increased so, so as to include a right not to be disturbed by people in nearby apartments who are running the kind of music that I find repellent. So the externalities disappear the moment when you define private property rights in a precise enough fashion so as to prevent this kind of, um, uh, what is the term, the not overflowing, but spillovers, yeah spillovers then you have certain activity that uh, 
in the system of insufficient property rights can infringe on your interests and you have no way of you have no way of protecting yourself against it so that's criticism of pigou criticism of cause is different so what cause did was ronald cause is to say huh, look there is one crucial aspect one crucial component of this theory of externality and that is that, that it accepts the concept of free information information remember the concept of the privately perfectly competitive markets assume that information about the available business opportunities is free for everybody and and um, Pigou doesn't deny that so then Cole says look if you accept that the, the, the information about the available business opportunities is free and that the costs of negotiation are free then you don't need government intervention to solve the problem of externalities then everybody would know what what is the damage that is inflicted to his or her property they would know the size of the damage to them the people who inflict the damage they they would know the the size of the of the gains that they achieve by polluting for example and you will then have a process of negotiation irrespective of how property rights are assigned whether my private property right in my garden is sufficiently sufficiently legally protected or not if it's protected then it's okay for me i'm better off if it's not protected then i can bribe the guy who is polluting the the, the garden with a part of my economic value that i derive from a, from, from a garden or from my arable land to say you can put the, the this smoke preventing device in your in your uh, uh, on your chimney on your on your um, factory and reduce the level of pollution for me so i'm gonna pay you i'm gonna bribe you with the parts of my proceeds to do that even if government doesn't protect protect me against the environmental pollution so this if information the cost of information and the cost of negotiation are zero or very low then you you would need government intervention to correct any market failures uh, any uh, government tax and subsidy policy you will the private negotiations but by, by individuals would achieve the same result so that's the causes idea basically that in a zero transaction cost world in other words if you have a couple of parties that have to negotiate this transfer of bribes then you don't need government intervention it's easy for them to do it so then you don't need government intervention however Cole says in in another paper if transaction costs are positive or high in other words if you have more than one party and it's difficult for them to negotiate the the precise arrangements then you need the government you need the judges to intervene and you need the judges this is important in in a world of positive transaction costs costs that the costs of negotiating and carrying out and enforcing agreements you will need uh, if these costs are positive or high you wouldn't have the agreements the the likelihood of agreements emerging will be very low because because of the height of this of this cost then you need the judiciary system and judges to assign property rights to assign rights to pollute or to be protected against pollution essentially in such a way as to maximize the total economic welfare total economic efficiency so this is the idea now you cannot believe any more in the uh, individuals involved parties involved to negotiate among themselves and maximize the social welfare if transaction costs are high now you need the judges to assign property rights to different people or reassign them or redistribute them in any way 
they consider useful so as to maximize the economic wealth or economic welfare of society as a whole. So that's the cause of the idea and Demzit is very critical of that. And Demzit says that's problematic because it treats judiciary system and governmental enforcement mechanism mechanisms system of contract enforcement and and the rule of law as as economic goods as something that is not for free he says yes that's considered to be given and for free in the in the perfect uh, competition system but you cannot solve the problem by treating it as as being not free because why why you cannot do it that way because judges have no better way of gauging the extent of social cost and economic efficiency nothing more than government central planners do if you accept that social social and individual costs are not directly measurable by the parties outside of the of the transaction so farmer and farmer and a factory can negotiate because they have the idea about what costs them what and what is the expected benefits for them but the outside government bureaucrat cannot gauge that so that's the argument against <clears throat> against pigu's tax and subsidy policy but then Demz it says the same thing applies to to causes idea of judges and as, as welfare and utility maximizers how on earth judges could know to whom right to pollute or to own a resource should be given if they're outside of the economic system so judges are not trained to be economists or economic analysts and they have no bet any better way of gauging private costs and benefits that than government bureaucrats do and so he says, ironically, the only way to make judges, and he says that in the, in the lecture that you that, that you watched, the only way to make judges more responsive more responsive to real market pressures and really interested in maximizing social welfare, you will actually have to allow them to receive bribes. Because if you have two parties two parties vying for the control of the same resource. For example, a factory that wants, wants a right to pollute and a farmer who wants a right to be protected against pollution. The only way for a judge to know who will be, who is likely to maximize the value of total social re resources here, whether the factory or, or the farmer would be to allow them to bribe the judge, to pay for right to pollute. So that's the only objective way how you can gauge indirectly in any way whatsoever who is the least cost avoider, as Cole says, who, who will, would be using societal resources in such a way as to improve the most the economic value of resources. So only corrupt judges who would receive bribes from the parties involved would have any reasonable chance of maximizing social welfare or social utility. That's essentially Demzitz's argument. So you can forget about judges maximizing social, social welfare. If certain, if, if transaction costs of negotiation about something are so high that they cannot be achieved on the free market, that's for him sufficient argument that these transactions shouldn't have taken place to begin with, that it's economically inefficient. So that's the idea that high transaction costs are not in any shape or form reason for us to consider the resulting economic outcomes to be inefficient in any way. So he says that on page 10 here, shaded part, the amount of suit from the production of steel may remain positive even if its presence results in an increase in the cost of laundering to a nearby laundry owner. 
if it remains positive because the cost of transacting be between laundry and mill owners is too great to make a transaction worth undertaking, or because the launderer and steel mill owner believe that the cost of substituting hard coal for soft is too great to make a transaction, a transaction worth undertaking, then this positive amount of suit is efficient. So any number of reasons could result in, in having a uh, ha having a higher social cost and having a uh, having certain amount of pollution in the environment. So the optimal level of pollution, optimal level of externality is not zero. So we are not comparing the really existing world with, with some nirvana, as Demzet said. It's some state of perfect bliss and perfection in which the amount of bad, bad things and annoying things is zero. No, we are comparing this situation under the private property rights regime with an alternative system in which the government would be running the show. So he says in both cases, whatever causes the, uh, some suit to, uh, to exist in the environment, more suit descends on the laundry than if the, if the cost of reducing suit were smaller. But if we do not think resources are wrongly allocated in the case in which hard coal is too costly to use, why should we think resources are wrongly allocated in the case in which transaction cost is too great to bear? You see, they may, the same result could emerge from the situation when they negotiate and they conclude that it's too costly to, to that, that, that the laundry firm cannot bribe sufficiently the, the the manufacturing firm to uh, replace the hard, hard coal with soft coal, as well as when 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 uh, negotiation costs are too high, when they, they cannot negotiate because there are so many parties involved, the result is the same. You will have a positive amount of soot. Both situ situations are com compatible with efficient alloc res resource allocation, and after all, it is efficiency that is claimed by the neoclassical model, not the complete absence of interaction costs. Neither negotiation nor hard coal is so in and, in, in and of itself. Indeed, one can rewrite the neoclassical model with the transaction costs embedded in it and still deduce from it an efficient allocation of resources. Transaction costs just shift supply curves upward or demand curves downward or some combination of both, as would an increase in any cost and it carries no special implication of inefficiency at equilibrium values of price and output. So then this is conclusion is actually that the perfect competition model is efficient even in the, even in the, um, light of criticism uh, leveled by, by Pigou and by Coase. Okay, so that's a brief, that's a brief uh, summary of Demzitz's argument. And in a minute, I will, I will start a new video on offering my take on takings, uh, Richard Epstein's uh, article on his famous book, um, takings.